Ionia is an island continent just to the northeast of Valorant and is a place of balance and peace, an island where the inhabitants try to live as in tune with magic, nature, and the spirit realm as possible. But Ionia also has its own fair share of struggles internally in the wake of an invasion that wreaked havoc on the first lands. Here's everything you need to know about Ionia in like 15 minutes. As always, this video is going to focus on Ionia as a setting, what it's like to live there, the lay of the land, the factions and people you'll encounter, etc. We'll also touch on history, but it won't be the most in-depth history lesson in the world. It's just a strong enough foundation for you to know what's going on. That's the goal with all the videos in this series. Think of it as Region 101. We set up a base for you and you're free to go deep dive whatever subject you choose. If you're brand new to Runeterra lore or you're coming from my shorts, there's an intro to Runeterra video on my channel. I highly recommend checking that out. It gives you a full overview of the world map and the base level timeline in like 12 minutes. Super worth it. Then come back here. And if you like this video, remember to like and subscribe, please. Okay, Ionia time. Ionia's main island is divided into two regions by a mountain range in the middle. The two regions are Navorai to the west and Shanzan to the east. Navorai is jam-packed with stuff to talk about. Most importantly, there's the Garden of Forgetting, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's a garden where the flowers and fruit are magic and can remove a person's memories. Amakailan, aka the heart of the world. This sacred grove is the former location of the God Willow, a giant, like, world tree approximate. Eventually, the God Willow was destroyed by warriors from the Freljord, specifically cut down by Ivern the Cruel. All of nature in Ionia felt that death, and that death also also consumed Ivern, and in his death, he saw the beauty of the natural world and regretted his actions, and centuries later, this is where the Green Father would emerge, Ivern reborn as the watchful protector of nature. There's the Placidium of the Navorai, another intensely sacred place in Ionia with magical gardens and renowned colleges of study. The Placidium is actually such an important place in Ionia that it became a prime target during the Noxus invasion, as we'll see later, and was the site of one of the most important battles of the war. There's the Temple of Thanjul, formerly the Kinku Order's headquarters, now under Shadow Order control, the Temple of Koshin, another temple for the Kinku Order, and and Wele, I probably said that wrong, an unmapped coastal village that's functionally cloaked by the power of Ionia. The village isn't welcoming to outsiders, and nature will eat up ships attempting to land at the port. Shanzan, the other half of the mainland, has a lot less known about it, although it is home to the temple and village of Zwanane, a village built near an ancient Kinku temple that was abandoned long ago until it became used once more after the apparent death of former Kinku master Kusho during the Noxus invasion. To the west of the mainland is Faelor, the location of the Dreaming Pool. This is the pool that imprisoned the League champion Syndra, an extremely strong Ionian mage, until a pair of Vestaya freed her in an attempt to have her aid them against Noxus, a plan that didn't work out for them. South of the mainland is the island of Barl, which most importantly hosted the Wuju village, the birthplace of the martial arts style of the same name. This village was destroyed in the Noxian invasion, and now the surviving master Yi carries on the Wuju tradition by teaching it to pupils. Then there's a string of islands on the eastern side of the mainland of Ionia, and from north to south they are the northernmost island Raylin, which houses the Hirana Monastery, then Ulin and Kaelin. South of that is the larger island of Zion, heavily set with mountains and some pretty cool landmarks. Kashuri is a settlement on the southern part of Zion that's known for making weapons and armor, and in recent times they've begun making new weapons that utilize Ionia's inherent magic. Think like Hextech, but without the scorpion slaughtering or pollution creating hex crystals. Swirl Rocks, I feel like the picture does this one justice. The Temple of the Dragon Knight an Order of Shadow controlled temple, and Tula, where Master Kusho, Shen, and Zed imprisoned the golden demon Kata Jin. The Xian Highlands, all around the mountains, house the Gajin River, where Jin was finally captured. At this point, I've mentioned Jin twice, so it's best to just tell you, in two minutes, you're going to hear all about Jin, and most of what you're going to hear probably happened in the Xian Highlands. I'm not even going to name all the places in this region, because a lot of them are honestly just named because they're like, somewhere Jin wiped out a village or something. But also, it has the Olgathi Forest and the Sotka River, and the Temple of Rishai. The Rishai were a sect of Kinku followers who supported pacifism no matter what, even in the wake of the war. And finally, the southernmost islands, Galrin and Sidaro, collectively referred to as Huojo for the tribe of humans that live on them. Sidaro is the southernmost and smallest of the two, Galrin is the larger of the two. It has a desert in the middle known as the Getu Sea, a forest at the tip, and an ancient coastal village of Palace. Palace is actually pretty important. It hosts the Temple of Palace, which is where the Dark and Varus, in the form of his bow, was imprisoned until Valmar and Kai, two Ionian hunters, accidentally freed him and ended up fused into a single body with Varus in a bizarre soul three-way. Okay, we made it. That's the continent of Ionia. All that's left is the rest of the video. We can get the government part of this one out of the way pretty quick, because there isn't really much we know about Ionia's form of government. They don't really seem to have an overarching body with massive influence. 
There are regional governments that manage their respective areas, villages that have their own councils, and they don't always get along with one another. Ionia's culture and lifestyle is all about balance and harmony, with nature, with the spiritual, with themselves. It's not surprising that this balance is central to the Ionian way of life. Magic permeates the air and everything in Ionia, with the barrier between the spirit realm and the mortal realms being especially thin. This deep connection to the natural world influences every aspect of Ionian life. Their clothing features the bright colors and natural patterns of the world around them, from both flora and fauna. Their architecture is natural too. There's an entire profession known as wood weavers that just convince trees and vegetation to grow in the shape of houses rather than cutting down the trees to make homes, since that would upset the nature spirits in the area and effectively curse the family living there. When you think of buildings and structures in Ionia, just think built into the world. The architecture moves up and down and in and out as the trees in the ground do. Ionia's cultural devotion to balance and spiritual understanding has naturally driven them towards neutrality and a peaceful existence for most of their time, even though they have a variety of martial arts across their various settlements and monasteries. Finally, it'd be remiss of me not to mention the Spirit Blossom Festival, a festival in Ionia where the spirit world opens itself up to mortals, the living can communicate with their dead loved ones, and spirits touch the mortal realm. Honestly, when you think of Ionians and their culture, just think of druids and monks. That's your grounding reference. Just druids and monks, all the way down. Okay, you can't talk about Ionia without talking about the Vistaya, Runeterra's resident human-animal hybrid race. To clear something up right away, not every anthropomorphic character you see in Runeterra is a Vestayan. There are Minotaurs, the Shuriman Ascended God Warriors, Kyrians, and a bunch of other exceptions to the rule. But there are a lot of different Vestayan tribes, and they're spread out across the world, so there's a non-zero chance that if you see someone with animal features, they might be Vestayan. The Vestaya are descendants of the Vestaya Shirei, beings who drew immense power from the spirit realm in order to defeat a race of sky giants known as the Titans. Fun fact, you can still see the remnants of this war in Ionia, thousands and thousands of years later. The picture we're looking at now is actually on the island of Barl. Post-war, these Vistaya Shirei settled with mortals once more and intermingled with them, their hybrid offspring being less magical and disseminating across the land as Vistaya. In terms of appearance, Vistaya could trend towards being more animal-like or more human-like and anywhere in between. Most Vistaya have at least some ability to shapeshift, even if it's just small things like Rokon's cloak color or something like that. Vistayan tribes are divided into three categories, tribes of the sea, tribes of the sky, and the landwalker tribes. A Piltovern explorer was kind enough to give us a tree of tribes for the Vistaya to show how some of the lineage shakes out, although there are likely countless more Vistayan tribes. There's the fishy type Mirai in the Tribes of the Sea, which includes the Lee champion Nami, the Vasani, Ari's tribe, who are fox-like in appearance and have been presumably wiped out save for Ari herself, the goat-like Atrani, who live near Mount Targon. Soraka actually takes the appearance of an Atrani, even though she's technically a celestial and not Vestayan herself, the Kilosh, a tribe focused on the thrill of the hunt who lives somewhere in Ixtal, this is Rangar's tribe, the Lotlin, a bird-like tribe that houses both Rakan and Zaya, the Shimon, Wukon's monkey-like tribe, and the Uvikot, a very old tribe of Vestaya that we actually only know two members of, one of them being Nico. There are other tribes in Vestayan as well. We see them in pictures and lore stories, in Legends of Runeterra art, and even in champions like Set. The scion of different tribes in appearance can in fact mate with one another, with their offspring's appearance being dependent on the magic the child grows up near, what connections it has to animal spirits, and the parents' appearance. Magic is key to Vestayan culture. They'll end up settling near where magic is strongest, like reservoirs or rivers of magic throughout the world, although they don't always have to be in proximity to magic. That's it, that's Vestaya 101. In the description, I'll specifically call out which league champions are Vestayan, so if you want to go learn more, you can. Maybe one day we'll go a little more more in depth in a different video too, like maybe we do a Races of Runeterra video, is that something people would like? That seems like it could be fun, maybe? Tell me if you want to see a Races of Runeterra video. Factions wise, we're basically just going to talk about monastic orders, because Ionia has a bunch. There's the Hirana Order, who are devoted to the idea of harmony and balance within your own self. They're a pacifistic order, who, when defense is required, specialize in redirecting and countering opponents' strikes. If you think of the League Champion Udir, this is actually where he was raised. The Shojin Order, the designated protectors of peace and balance in Ionia, channeling the Dragon Spirit in order to master the art of inner healing and combat. The Wuju Order, who we talked about a little bit in geography, they practice the ancient martial art Wuju style, and in the wake of the Noxian War, Master Yi is actually the only living master of the Wuju style, although he's currently passing it along to pupils like Wukong. There's also the Navori Brotherhood, the only non-monk order we're going to talk about. These people think that Ionia needs to unify and militarize in order to be stronger and prevent what happened with Noxus from ever happening again. It's a belief they hold so strongly that they'll attack anyone in Ionia who disagrees. And folks, I saved what I think are the two most important for last. The Kinku, 
an ancient clan of monks who preserve the sacred balance between the spirit and mortal realms, walking and stepping between the two to do so. They're currently led by Shen, but they have a key trifecta of warriors who help lead and guide the order. Kenan, the Heart of the Tempest, a Yordle monk who is the longest standing member of the Kinku and has always held the title. The Fist of Shadow, currently unoccupied but once filled by a Kali. And Shen, the Eye of Twilight, the de facto leader who administers justice for the Kinku. And the final faction you should concern yourself with, the Order of Shadow, led by Zed, a group of warriors that formed after a defection from the Kinku and utilized powerful shadow magic to fight Ionia's enemies and protect the nation. Wow, Mike, that sounds like a cool story. Sure would be cool to know more about that, wouldn't it? There's many stories in Runeterra that set themselves in Ionia, but we're going to focus on two really key history pieces that put Ionia where it is today. The first is the Golden Demon, a story of how Xion was terrorized for years by a monster who would massacre villages and leave a trail of destruction in its wake. The Kinku eventually stepped in, with Grandmaster Kusho, his son Shen, and his prized pupil Yusan traveling to Xion to investigate the killings. They journeyed across the island, witnessing horrific displays of violence that shook them to their core. Shen lost his sense of humor, and Usan became bitter and vengeful. Eventually, they tracked and caught the Golden Demon, who turned out to be a serial killer by the name of Kata Jin, and although Usan was ready to kill Jin, Kusho ordered that he be imprisoned instead. Neither young man agreed with Kusho's decision, but Shen accepted it. Usan, on the other hand, would harbor his feelings of spite for years to come. And the second, and probably inarguably the most impactful historical event we're going to talk about is the Noxian invasion of Ionia. After scouting and infiltrating Ionia for a while, the then Grand General of Noxus, Borum Darkwell, began his invasion. One of the first targets that Noxus goes after is Phalor, the island to the southwest of mainland Ionia, which you may remember from earlier in the video was where Syndra was being held in the Dreaming Pool. Noxus ends up using the fortress at Phalor as a strategic base for basically the entire duration of the invasion. As the invasion rages on, Usan begins to grow impatient with Kusho and the Kinku's lack of action against the invaders. He splinters off and leaves the Kinku, but not before learning that there are powerful secrets regarding shadow magic within the temple. He rebrands himself as Zed and begins to gather followers that fight back against Noxus alongside the Navori Brotherhood. A series of battles wind up raging throughout the course of this war. The town of Palace is at the site of the battle where two lovers, Valmar and Kai, fight back against the Noxians. Kai, nearly dead, is brought to the temple by Valmar, who throws Kai into the pit in the middle of the temple in an attempt to save him. This happens to be the pit holding the Dark and Varus, and the three end up fusing together in a single body. Varus then repels the Noxian invasion of Pallas, and then pieces out of Ionia. Another battle occurs at the Placidium of Navori, where the blade dancer Aurelia and Ionian forces beat back Noxus. It's here that Aurelia and Swain fight, with Aurelia cutting off Swain's arm. In the aftermath, Aurelia becomes an idolized leader of the Resistance, while Swain makes a pact with the Demon of Secrets, Rom, granting him a new demon arm? before he returns to Noxus and is discharged from the military. Zed, requiring more power to fight off Noxian invaders, marches his followers on the Kinku Temple in search of the Tears of the Shadow, an artifact that contains the shadow magic power he's after. Zed runs into the temple to get the artifact, and Kusho chases after him, but only Zed emerges, artifact in hand. And although it looks like Zed killed his former master here, he actually helped Kusho fake his death, so that the latter could work in secret to assume control of the Navori Brotherhood. Zed, with the secrets of the Shadow in tow, formally forms the Order of Shadow, and Shen, leads the battered Kinku away to rebuild and reform the order. Both orders are still at odds with one another, but they do have like a tentative truce peace in the wake of the Noxian invasion. Noxian and Ionian forces would continue to clash for a while until eventually Swain forms his coup in Noxus, takes control of the Noxian Empire, and then pulls the forces back out of Ionia. Even though the Noxian invasion is technically over, Noxus does still control some territory on the southern part of Ionia. We also know that at some point in the relatively near future, Noxus does try and invade Ionia again, but the details are a little sketchy on timing and whether that's happening right now or in the future a little bit, so I wouldn't worry too much about that for the purposes of this video. And that's where we're going to wrap this video. With that, you should have a pretty good foundational knowledge of Ionia. You should be able to understand anything you read or watch that takes place there. If you're interested in personally reading more, check out the universe page, it's linked below. There's comics and a ton of stories about Ionia. And be sure to comment and tell me what regions or concepts you want to see touched on next. Okay, bye.